It is such a blessing that we are able to study together tonight. I hope to see all of you this coming Sunday in person at 9.30 for our study of 1 Thessalonians and then for worship at 10.30. As far as our prayer concerns, let's remember to continue praying for Denisha's family as they recover, as well as for my mom, who is scheduled to have surgery tomorrow. And then let's also remember the memorial service for Al Ovidal coming up in a week and a half on June 4th, and we plan on visiting and having finger foods outside together at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, June 4th, and then we'll have the service at 2 o'clock, after which we'll be dismissed for the day. And if you're willing and able to help with the food for that, please be sure to sign up on the bulletin board at church. If you have any questions about that, uh, get in touch with Gary Mueller, and I'm sure he'd be able to uh, answer all of your questions on that. Tonight we are continuing in our study of the book of Genesis. Genesis is a book of beginnings. That's what the word means. It was written primarily by Moses. And up to this point, we've looked at the creation of everything in chapter 1, the creation of man and woman in particular in chapter 2. We looked at the first sin in chapter 3 and then the first murder in chapter 4. And that brings us to Genesis chapter 5 tonight. And the first paragraph is Genesis chapter 5 verses 1 through 5. So Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Then the days of Adam, after he became the father of Seth, were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Notice in the first two verses, we have a summary of the first few chapters. God creates man and woman in his own image. And in this chapter, we'll give an overview of Adam's generations, or his descendants, we might say today. So starting in verse 3, we have the beginning of an extensive family tree, starting with Adam, who became the father of Seth when he was 130 years old. And just as Adam was made in God's likeness, so also Seth was created in Adam's likeness. That is, they were similar. There was a family resemblance. And just another note on this, if Adam is made in the image of God, and if Seth is made in the image of Adam then doesn't that mean that Seth ultimately also bears the image of God? I think we understand the way this is going, and uh, that image or that likeness is passed on down through the generations. And then doesn't that also mean that we bear the image of God ourselves? And I think that's very obviously accurate to say all of us are made in the image of God. And this has some huge implications, starting with the fact that all human life is sacred. As human beings, we are different from conception to natural death. We bear the image of God. So that's something we can learn from the first few verses here. At the end of verse 4, we find that Adam had other sons and daughters. Obviously, you can have a lot of kids over a 900-year period. That seems to be what happens. So that's a huge lifespan. But we'll get back to that at the end of our study tonight and make a few notes on the uh, large lifespans. But let's continue tonight with Genesis 5. Verses 6 through 20. Genesis 5, verses 6 through 20. Seth lived 105 years and became the father of Enosh. Then Seth lived 807 years after he became the father of Enosh, and he also had other, he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and became the father of Kenan. Then Enosh lived 815 years after he became the father of Kenan, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Kenan lived 70 years and became the father of Mahalalel. Then Kenan lived 840 years after he became the father of Mahalalel, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. Mahalalel lived 65 years and became the father of Jared. Then Mahalalel lived 830 years after he became the father of Jared, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. Jared lived 162 years and became the father of Enoch. Then Jared lived 800 years after he became the father of Enoch, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, 
and he died. So once again, we have a series of long lifespans, most of which are more than 900 years. Personally, the only name that is significant to me is Enoch. And we have a bit more about Enoch in the next paragraph. So let's continue on with Genesis 5, verses 21 through 32. Genesis 5, 21 through 32. Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Methuselah lived 187 years and became the father of Lamech. Then Methuselah lived 782 years after he became the father of Lamech, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of a son. Now he called his name Noah, saying, This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. Then Lamech lived 595 years after he became the father of Noah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. Noah was 500 years old, and Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Hopefully we recognize several names in this paragraph. They should be familiar to us. We have a note up in verses 21 through 24 that Enoch walked with God. And this is repeated twice, and then we have the explanation that Enoch was not for God took him, and I think this is in clear contrast to all the other men in this chapter who are described as dying. So they died, Enoch did not, he simply walked with God. Uh, but for some reason it seems that Enoch did not have to endure death. And you may remember something similar happens to another character in the Bible, if you can remember, there's at least one more who doesn't die. A prophet by the name of Elijah, who was taken away in the chariot of fire, if you remember that. Um, to me, to walk with God is to be like God, to be with unity, uh, or to be in unity with God, like walking side by side with a friend or a spouse or something like that. We have a little bit more information on this later in the Bible. In Hebrews 11, 5, for example, the Bible says, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And so Enoch then was spared from death, particularly because he acted and he lived by faith. And I'd forgotten about this, but we also actually have a quote from Enoch over in Jude, verses 14 and 15. In Jude chapter 1, no chapter divisions in this book, so simply Jude, I guess verses 14 and 15 we would say, but speaking of false teachers, Jude says, It was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of their, uh, all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so, I, again, I know I've read those verses a number of times through the years, but Enoch was a prophet. And I know in our list of prophets, I believe we had Enoch listed there, but it's not something we often think about. So Enoch then was a prophet, a man speaking on God's behalf. Beyond Enoch, we also have a reference to Methuselah in this passage. And most of us know from the time we were little kids that Methuselah is known for being the oldest person in the Bible. And I say a lot of us have known that from the time of our youth. I guess that's uh, no, no longer accurate today, unfortunately. We're kind of living in a, a post-religious, post-Bible knowledge kind of society. So I guess if you were to run around the block and ask people who Methuselah was, many of them, most of them probably would have no clue. But hopefully a number of us recognize uh, recognize Methuselah as being the oldest lifespan ever recorded, uh, living to the age of 969. Uh, we have a chart to look at in just a little bit, so that'll help it make a little bit more sense. But for now, we have just this brief note here that when we do the math, it looks like um, Methuselah dies in the year of the flood, which is really neat to consider. Um, we're not told that he dies in the flood, Although that is a possibility, but he does die in the same year that the flood happens. 
And so it's just kind of interesting to think about. Uh, I would also make a note of Lamech in this chapter. You may remember Lamech from Genesis 4, but these are two different Lamechs. So like today, we have a lot of people who share a name. Uh, last week's Lamech was a descendant of Cain, and he's described as being a very evil man, a man of violence and revenge, the avenge sevenfold, you know, that kind of thing. Um, this week's Lamech is a different guy altogether. He is a descendant of Seth. And this one must have done something right because he raises a young man named Noah who ends up being the only righteous man on the face of the earth. But we'll get back to that next week. But the name Noah, by the way, means rest, uh, indicating, as Moses points out to us here, that Lamech thought his son Noah would perhaps bring some sense of rest to the world. So there's some sense of hope here. And then we end this chapter with Noah and with his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. By the way, we have an interesting order here. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, especially when we consider from other passages that the birth order actually seems to be a Japheth, then Seth, and then Ham. So why then are they usually listed as Shem, Ham, and Japheth? Why are they not listed in their birth order? Well, we aren't given the reason. We aren't told specifically why this is. But I think it may be because Shem is in the genealogy of Jesus. And for this reason, Shem is most important in this account. Again, I wouldn't swear my soul on this. I wouldn't swear my soul on about anything, for that matter. But in this chapter of death, 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 we close this chapter with Shem being listed first. And so a descendant of Shem would ultimately bring an end to all of this death. So that's just speculation on my part as to the reason, but I do think it's notable that they are not listed in birth order, but that Shem is listed first. As we take in this huge list of names, and I know we've had a, a dozen or two dozen names in this chapter. A lot of those are a little bit hard to pronounce, but as we kind of observe what we've seen in this chapter, as we think about what we've observed, I guess would be more accurate to say. I want us to close tonight by uh, making a few notes, a few observations here. And first of all, let's deal with the long lifespans in this chapter. I know some have wondered, how is this possible? You know, surely this must be fictional. This is proof positive that the Bible is all made up. People do not live 900 plus years. And some, in fact, have tried to find a way around this. Um, John Clayton, for example, a theistic evolutionist, trying to merge creation with the evolutionary theory and trying to find a way around this, he has suggested that the years in this chapter uh, really should be considered as months. And he's got this complex explanation of this, but uh, this, though, creates a whole lot more problems than it actually solves. And so I, I certainly wouldn't uh, listen to John uh, Clayton's advice on this or really anything else connected with the creation or evolution. So how do we deal with the huge lifespans in Genesis chapter 5? A few things to consider here. Uh, let's just kind of realize that other living organisms do live many, many years. You know, we have trees on this planet that have lived three to 4,000 years. We have tortoises that have lived well over 200 years. Uh, from what I understand, there are some sponges, some other organisms in the sea that are known to live much, much longer even than that. And so I'm just saying that having a long lifespan of some kind of living creature is certainly uh, within the realm of possibility for other species. So let's not... Uh, be too concerned about this, and, and let's be very slow, obviously, as in never, uh, to dismiss this as being some kind of a fictional account. Let's just not go in that direction. But even for humans, I think something else we need to consider here is that before the flood, the earth was a much different place than it is right now. Uh, for example, some have suggested that the earth had a much thicker uh, atmosphere back then. That's in my non-scientific way of thinking. That's the way I would describe it. Sometimes described as a water barrier or a water canopy. You know, there was wa water above, water beneath. We learned in Genesis chapter one. So some kind of a, like a water, thick water canopy around the outside or at the edge of our atmosphere, protecting us from the radiation from the sun and those damaging rays. So just think about the damage that sun can cause today. In terms of various cancers and mutations and, and so on, um, that most likely was not a factor at all before the flood. They were living in this absolutely perfect environment. 
Uh, we might also add to this that humans were only vegetarians before the flood. We noted this several weeks ago as God gave them only uh, permission to eat plants before the flood. So they weren't eating animals. Um, and then add to this, think about the food that we eat today. Um, this morning I had eggs and bacon and hash browns fried in oil and butter. I can guarantee you I will not live to 969 years eating that kind of food. I mean, that right there is a limiting factor. We look at the leading causes of death in our country today. The top two, three, maybe four, uh, certainly a majority out of the top ten would be contributed to what we eat and our lack of movement. And so if you're walking around in a perfect environment and just eating stuff straight out of the ground without the processing and so on, I'm assuming that uh, that could play uh, could play a role in this situation here. Uh, we would also note on top of this that humans were more genetically perfect back then, much closer to the original creation. And so they weren't dealing with copies of copies of copies of copies, if we want to put it crudely like that, um, but less time span from the beginning for mistakes to creep into the uh, DNA and, and so on. So none of this, you know, liver disease passed on in families or kidney disease or heart disease, you know, none of that was a factor way back then. So I'm just saying under perfect conditions, protected from the sun, eating only plants, unaffected by genetic diseases we have today, and uh, constantly moving, running around and, and doing that kind of thing, these long lifespans certainly start seeming uh, to be within the realm of possibility. So before we just say, oh, that can't be true, uh, we do need to consider some of these factors. But we should also note that lifespans quickly drop off almost immediately after the flood, and that kind of figures in here. Um, I know the, the print may be too small to see all of it on this chart, but this is one of the best that I've seen where they give permission to share it like we are tonight. Um, obviously, we're not endorsing anything this group might teach or promote in the fine print here. Um, but I hope we notice a few things on this chart if you're able to see it. But first, just notice the drop in lifespans at the moment of the flood. The flood is that vertical black line about two-thirds of the way over from left to right. And notice the lifespans on this chart span from Adam at the top left all the way down to Joseph in the bottom right. So even if you can't read the labels in the years, that's not the important thing on the chart here, but even if you can't read the fine print here, notice before the flood, people were living into their 900s, and then they quickly drop after the flood from 500 to 400 years, then to the 200s, and fairly quickly down to around 100 years old. So I'm just saying that the flood absolutely changes things. The environment changes. Uh, people obviously start eating meat at that time. You know, bacon gets involved, and... And suddenly you go from 900 years down to 100 years. But I'd say, you know, life was more worth living being able to eat some of those uh, good things. But for whatever reasons, lifespans drop drastically at the flood. And that this chart at least makes this obvious, and I appreciate that. Uh, and while the chart is on the screen on a slightly different uh, subject, I would also note how Methuselah lives to the year of the flood. If you remember, I just briefly mentioned that. And again, not that he necessarily dies in the flood, not that he drowns. But it's just interesting that he dies the same year as the flood, and this chart makes that obvious in a way that we can't see in the written word. I would also note that this chart helps to explain a passage that we'll get to later in Genesis 47. So just, you know, hold this thought until like nine months from now when we're in Genesis 47. But you may remember this, where Joseph brings his father to Pharaoh once they come down to be helped through the famine and all that, and... And as he's introducing his dad to Pharaoh, Pharaoh says to Jacob, Joseph's father, how many years have you lived? It's kind of from one old guy to another, hey, how old are you? And Jacob answers and says, the years of my sojourning are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my father, fathers lived during the days of their sojourning. And Jacob then blesses Pharaoh and heads out. But based on the chart, you know, what we need to notice here is that Shem, Noah's son who was on the ark, could have conceivably held Jacob as a baby. Isn't that just a strange thing to consider? A guy who was on the ark could have conceivably held Jacob as an infant. So again, I'm not saying that he did, I'm just saying that the chart shows us that their lifespans actually overlapped for a little bit. 
And I just hadn't really thought about that until seeing it on a chart like this. And, you know, I'm not the math person. So as I'm reading Genesis 5, I'm not adding and subtracting and coming up with a timeline as some people have done. So I'm thankful for the good work that's been done here. Related to this, I would also note the timeline, uh, emphasizing that the earth is a whole lot younger than many people may think. You know, sometimes ancient genealogies like this may have gaps. There may have been, a, a you know, this may have been more of a summary than an absolute record of every possible generation. In fact, we know there are little missing chunks here and there based on other genealogies that come later where we have more information. Um, adding to this that the Hebrew word for father may sometimes be used to communicate the idea of ancestor. So, you know, it's not a, a strict every single person-to-person -person genealogy here, but even if we were to add in a few possible gaps here and there, uh, we're talking about just a few thousand years from Adam to Joseph. I mean, definitely not tens or hundreds of thousands of years. And I think that gets even more obvious when we see it in chart form like this. But getting back to our observations on this chapter, in addition to noting the long lifespans, I would also note that we have a whole lot of death going on in this chapter. And really, this seems to be a good and really a tragic reminder concerning the consequences of the first sin back in Genesis chapter 3. Remember, Satan said, surely you will not die. And that was not the truth by any stretch of the imagination. The wages of sin is death, as Paul will go on to tell us in the book of Romans. Um, over and over again, we have a name followed by the phrase, and he died. And I think that phrase, the exact phrase, and he died, is found um, eight times in this chapter, describing everybody but Enoch who walked with God and Noah who will die, but just not yet, uh, not in this chapter. So Genesis 5 is a chapter of birth, but also a chapter of death. So birth and death, birth and death, birth and death over and over again. So we have the long lifespans. We have this um, death kind of reigning, we might say, in chapter 5. Uh, the third observation I would make is a little bit less obvious, but in this chapter we see an ongoing struggle between good and evil. Good versus evil. I just briefly alluded to it earlier with the reference to the two Lamechs. Uh, one, a descendant of Cain in chapter 4, very evil man, and then the other, a descendant of Seth in chapter 5. The Lamech who descended from Cain was known for violence and revenge. He was a murderer. Um, and he was also known for introducing polygamy to the human race. So that's Lamech number one. The Lamech here in chapter five, on the other hand, is in a line of people, including Enoch, who walks with God. And in the line leading up to Noah, who will ultimately be the only righteous man on earth by the time we get to Genesis chapter six. I would also note again that the Lamech of Genesis five names his son Noah, meaning rest saying, This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. And so I'm just saying Lamech then had a spiritual side. He was concerned about spiritual things. He remembered the curse that God had made many years before this. Remember, the descendants of Cain in the previous chapter, they were known for implementing um, implements of bronze and iron. But on this side of the family, they seem to have something a little bit more spiritual going on. There are none of those, um, you know, technological conquests listed in this chapter as we did in the previous chapter. Uh, not that the people in chapter 5 are perfect by any means. They are not. Uh, but there does seem to be something of a contrast between the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Seth. There is this ongoing struggle between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman ultimately leading to the birth of Jesus many, many years down the line. Well, this brings us to the end of our study tonight. I know it's been a long list of names, basically, but I think we've moved fairly quickly through here, which I think is good for, uh, for the context. But I think we've also made these observations that will hopefully help us to uh, kind of have some kind of practical application of this and uh, try to remember what's going on here. Next week, we hope to start looking at the events leading up to the flood. This is Genesis chapter 6, if you want to get ready for that. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to study with us tonight. I'm looking forward to getting back to it next week with the uh, beginning of uh, the life of Noah and how he leads up to the flood. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are a God of life, creating and breathing life into Adam and then Eve and creating us with the amazing ability to multiply and fill the earth just as you had commanded. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus the way, the truth, and the life.
Thank you for saving us from the curse of sin and death. We're thankful for the promise of eternal life. And tonight we pray for the courage to choose the life that you have provided. In Jesus we pray. Amen.